Benji, uh, as Benji said, my name is Dave Olfeld. I'm the director of the Division of Fish and Wildlife from Minnesota DNR, and I wanted to take a moment to mark this 100th episode of the Minnesota Outdoor Skills and Stewardship Series. These webinars grew out of the desire that um, DNR staff had to continue to provide outdoor learning opportunities during the pandemic. So out of necessity, this arose and the first episode aired on March 31st, 2021, and it was about turkey hunting. And since then, there have been a whole array of topics from kayak fishing to getting a hunting dog to foraging for morels to today's topic, which is uh, foundational fire starting. So I want to take a, another minute to thank the DNR staff who have planned and uh, organized these webinars. It's not a trivial thing at all to, to line people up and to organize these and to put these on every week. So I want to uh, extend my thanks and appreciation to, uh, to those uh, folks in DNR. I want to thank uh, the many experts who have shared their passions and knowledge with folks like you. And then to those of you who are attending today and others, are, I've been told that there are 500 people on today viewing and that we've had over 10,000 views of, of the webinars that are um, stored on our webpage. So this is, has um, met, a, met a need. It's not like being out there doing it in person, but this is a way for, for folks to, to learn about uh, something new and, and, and uh, explore a new idea in, uh, from, the, from the warmth and comfort of your, your home office or wherever you are today. So with that, again, thanks. And Benji, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for the kind words. It really has been kind of a labor of love and uh, it's, it's been a, a great thing. So thank you to all the people that keep joining us week after week. Uh, the DNR as a whole has a lot of really cool stuff. We do a lot of really cool work and important work and we enjoy sharing that with you. So I think with that, we will uh, go over to Pam. Pam's joining us from actually from her kitchen today. As everybody probably knows, it's it's a uh, Busy day across Minnesota with this expected snowstorm. So we are uh, joining instead of live from Dodge Nature Center, we are joining live Pam from her house. And she's going to talk about foundational fire building today. So something that hopefully if you're a, a youngster at home, you wait until your parents come home and, and participate in this. But it's a fun thing to get out and, and start some fires. So with that, Pam, we'll turn it over to you. All right. Thanks, Benji. Welcome, everybody. Glad to have you joining us on this snowy, cloudy day. I know that the snow has probably disrupted a few people's plans, if you're anything like the rest of us. I'm joined today by a couple of my coworkers. So I have Signe on the camera, and I have Don, who's actually at this moment, hopefully making a larger fire outside. That will demonstrate about the size that would be useful for you if you were to put a fire in your backyard. I think we'll start with just a few fun facts about fire that I think a lot of people might not realize. Earth is actually the only planet that we know of where fires can happen. The reason for that is because we're the only known planet, at least in our solar system, that has oxygen. And oxygen is one of the basic needs that all fires require. Another fun fact is when you're burning your fires, sometimes people will ask, why is the fire different colors? And the colors depend on the amount of oxygen that's being let in to the fire. And another silly fun fact that many people didn't realize is that the actor Steve Buscemi from the famous movie Fargo was actually a New York City firefighter before he became an actor. And when the horrific incident 9-11 happened, he actually rejoined and was there in the city helping to alleviate some of the pain and suffering that people were going through during that. So just a few little tidbits that, you know, you can throw out the next time you're talking about fire. When we're talking about fire, the number one thing I do want to stress is safety. There's a lot of safety involved with fires, especially if you are a younger person, as Benji mentioned. So at no point should kids try this without their grown-ups around. You always want to make sure that you're in a safe place with some safe surroundings. 
So some things that you can do is if starting a fire in your backyard, you want to make sure that you're away from anything flammable, your house, any fences, a wooden swing set, your porch or deck. Always give yourself a wide berth. Another thing is never let the fire get too far out of control. A good safe thing to think about when having a backyard fire is kind of a three by three space. And at no point should it get larger than that. One of these things that's really good to do is to purchase one of those grates at any of the um, home improvement stores because they'll actually help you have a good idea of what a safe size fire is. If you're in a park, of course, never transport wood from anywhere due to the, the, the diseases that that might actually incur in other places. So only use pre-approved um, wood that would be safe, um, especially with the ash borer going on. Uh, so some needs that fire will require are three. One, I can't possibly show you, but it's all around us. It's oxygen. Quickest way to ruin your fire is smother it. And that's by putting things too tightly packed on your fire. The second thing all fires require is a heat source. And this can be a variety of things. Most people will use the easiest heat source available, available to them today, matches. A quick, easy strike will give you the heat source that most people will require. Of course, lightning is something that in the wild would be a heat source. You can also use a variety of other things that we'll talk about at the end of our demonstration. There are some other options, including friction, sparks, and that like. So some of the best fire starting materials I have displayed here on this safe metal platform. Now there's a difference between fuel and fire starting materials. We kind of put the fire start in, into three categories. There's tinder, which is extremely small, dry, and will catch a flame quickly. The downside is it will also burn quickly, so it's quick. The second step is you will want to add tinder, which is things that start to get a little bit larger, a little fuller. And finally, you'll want to add official fuel. So if you've ever started a fire with kids, you know, they think they can just take that match and light a log on fire. It's pretty hard to actually do that. So what you're going to want to gather is a supply of different sorts of tinder. And I'll show you a few of my favorites here on this platter. One of the things I think is absolutely wonderful that most people have everywhere in the country would be egg cartons. Egg cartons are wonderful fire starters. They'll catch easily and this particular kindling will burn a little longer than some others. The same is true for one of the best fire starters ever is birch bark. Now birch bark can be ripped into little strips, which work great. And the wonderful thing about birch bark is it will burn even if it becomes damp or wet. Another thing that most households have are cotton balls. Cotton balls are wonderfully flammable especially if you pull them apart, making greater surface area for sparks to catch. Some other varieties that we've used over the years, paper. Almost everybody's got some form of paper in a backpack, in a wallet, in your diaper bag. There are a variety of things. Um, we tease students that in a pinch, in a life-saving situation, you could burn your money. <laughs> Don't advise doing that today. A couple other things that are decent are pine needles after they've been completely dried. And then this was actually a bird's nest that we pulled apart. And this is dog hair. 
Lint from your dryer also works quite well. So these are things that will catch a flame quickly, but then go out fast. So the second ingredient you would want to add would be what we call kindling. This is tiny, yet will burn longer, and of course is dry. So I like little wood. If you're a carver and you have little bits of wood, you chip wood or the tiniest branches on the evergreens that as long as they are dry and they snap, they should be good kindling. Kindling should never be larger than your pinky finger. Finally, you can get into official fuel and that's things like, the kids always think this is going to be the fire starter, that's actual sticks, actual pieces of wood that as the fire catches, you can then add larger and larger and larger pieces. So what I'd like to do is show you a small demonstration inside here on how to start a very simple teepee fire. There are different styles. Everyone has their preferences. There's log cabins, there's teepees, there's just a big pile of stuff. I'm going to show you sort of a variation on the teepee using a variety of my tinder and kindling. We'll move to the fuel fire outside. So I'm going to actually take some of the dog hair because this is a great fluff that will catch sparks easily. We're going to put it on here. Then I'm actually going to take some of the bird nest, as you can see, very dry, very crumbly, very light. And then my favorite, which is the birch bark, will go next. When you're thinking about fire, it's called building a fire for a reason. You truly do want to try to layer your ingredients from the easiest to catch to the next, to the next, to the next, because fire will burn up. So we're going to actually just tear a few pieces of this wonderful birch bark to then lay on top of the fluff that should catch very quickly. And then we can start to add things like the kindling. So then we would take our small, slivered pieces of wood and start to build what's known as a teepee. Little by little, you can start to add more and more fuel. When we work with students, they just want to throw everything on. And I jokingly tell people the quickest way to put out a fire is let a bunch of fifth graders tend to it. Now, I'm going to light the match, and matches are small because they light quickly. The safest way to light a match is to hold it at the midpoint, not too close to where the flame will erupt, and not too far out so that you're able to get some pressure. For younger people, we tell them to strike away from your body just as a safety, safety organism. So here we go. Perfect. Now, a lot of people want to light the fire here, but what you always want to remember is fire burns up. So you want to start your fire touching the match to the underside, the lowest point on your teepee. So we're going to see, oh, and dog hair really smells when it starts <laughs> to burn. But it is a good fire starter. So we're going to see what happens and as our fire becomes larger and the actual fuel, the kindling, will start to catch, we would be able to continue to add larger and larger pieces of fuel. The most important thing is having things dry. So many people like to use grass and leaves, and a lot of times there's still a lot of moisture left in them. 
So I personally am not a fan of grass and leaves. Leaves will also create a lot of smoke. So will pine cones. And so if you are in a survival situation where you were trying to signal a, a plane, then you might want to have a lot of smoke. But if you're the average family sitting around a campfire, most people don't want a lot of smoke coming into their faces. So I avoid anything that could possibly create a lot of smoke. And as you can see, I've got a nice, small, contained teepee right here in my kitchen on a metal plate. And as you notice, I'm slowly adding, I'm feeding the fire. That's what you'll need to do. Always remembering to keep some pockets open for the other ingredient required, the air, the oxygen actually. So I'm just gonna do a couple more here so you can see how long this little tiny fire could continue to burn in my kitchen. Um, sometimes if you notice that your fire is going out, you can add a little oxygen, even in your exhale, there is some oxygen, so if people gently blow on the fire, you will be adding some oxygen to it. And what we're going to do is let this die out because I wanna show you a few other um, things that people have used over the course of time that are also a little bit fun. Now they're a step up from matches. So just keep that in mind, fire building is a skill. And like any skill that people start, a lot of folks are not wonderful right out of the get-go. So be patient if you're trying it and hang in there because with a little practice, you can be pretty good. I'm gonna share a few of these items with you that are on the table that are wonderful, fun fire starters. Many of you might have seen magnifiers. A magnifier will work by catching the heat from the sun and focusing it into a pinpoint, which will heat up. Now, it probably wouldn't start a fire again on my kitchen table, but if you have something small and nicely flammable, you can get a good fire started. One secret ingredient is something called char cloth and char cloth is made from a cotton material and partially burnt so that then it's going to catch those sparks very quickly you can make this at home we have a link to a video that will show you how to make it it's a great ingredient so when using some of these other items for fire building this is a wonderful addition Another thing that many people have played around with is the flint and steel. This is just a simple piece of steel metal shaped into a knuckle buster. And when doing this, it's not called knuckle buster for nothing. You do want to be careful that you don't smash your knuckles into the flint because this will be sharp. But what can happen is by striking, we're creating some friction which should bring about sparks. Can you see the sparks? Are they appearing in my camera, Sydney? All right. So that's a fun thing to do as well. It does require a little more skill, so don't be frustrated at first. Another fun thing, makes a great Christmas present for a, a, a teenager, is the magnesium sparky. So what we have here is a magnesium coated rod and then a steel slate. And how this one works is, again, we're going to strike and create friction, causing it to spark. As I set my kitchen table on fire, we'll be a little safer by doing it here. And I might be able to catch that char cloth if I'm lucky. These are really fun for kids to try. And I did throw a spark to catch my char cloth. Now, if you can see, the end of that is glowing. And this will glow slowly for a bit. 
the best way to use char cloth is to have some great tinder ready. So what I've done is I have actually taken some twine and jute twine natural materials work wonderful. I've actually frayed it into a puff ball, almost something like a nest. And watch how quickly this should erupt. If I don't set my eyeglass on fire. Hmm, I'll try it again. You wanna get it in that nest. And then I'm going to Maybe my material is not quite well enough. Um, we'll try it with this, see if we can get it going. But char cloth does work wonders. Also trying to avoid burning my hand. Oh, we're almost there. Well, you're getting the idea of what char cloth does. It must be my material here. This one was plastic, so I decided to avoid it. When using fire starting materials, you really do want to try to always use natural, ma natural made materials. We don't want to be setting plastic up into the environment. This is another activity that um, was a traditional method of making fire. This is the good old fashioned bow drill, which uses friction as well. And what will happen is, you would put the bow in. This was a great Native American way. And then you would have used friction and sawed the bow as such. We get a lot of people very frustrated with this one. I myself have never gotten a fire. I've gotten smoke. But this is a great fun tool for people to try. Um, if you ever want to frustrate a bunch of um, a bunch of folks at a party, pull this out. Uh, and this is something fun that you can easily make at home. This is a little kit that my son made that he kept in his car for the longest time. And it's a little fire starting kit. So what's in here is a candle, which is a wonderful fire starter once you get it lit, because this will last for longer than many other things. He's got some cotton balls in here. He's got birch bark. He does have some, ah, uh, some natural twine. He was smarter than his mother by putting in some great jute natural twine. And then he also has a sparky, a little bit of a different type that you use with his good old fashioned Boy Scout knife to create sparks like we did before. And this one's a little bit old. The problem with magnesium sparks is um, they will wear out eventually. So you do need to replace them after a while. What we'd like to do is show you how we took all these ingredients and actually created the perfect size fire for a backyard camp out, evening happy hour, marshmallow roast. So we're going to slowly walk you through so you don't get seasick and show you. Wanted, I was going to say, if you wanted to turn the video off while you go out there, we could just talk while you walk out there, Pam. And a beautiful fire in the driveway yeah. in St. Paul. So yeah, this is about the perfect size for a backyard fire. We've got a little bit of a different style here than the teepee. We've done what's called the lean to. So all the fire building supplies are sort of, so you can see how they're set up this way. Just a variation on the theme. Everybody has their favorite. Don said he did this one because of the wind. The wind is actually can be helpful 
or a hindrance. It can add oxygen, but it can also smother. So right now the wind is actually helping us by creating that oxygen flow that's allowing our fire to burn quite nicely right here in our driveway in St. Paul. <clears throat> ah, who brought the marshmallows? All right, you wanna come on back in with me? Yep. See if anyone has some questions you want to answer. That was great, Pam. Can you hear me? I can. So, um, awesome. Do folks have any uh, sort of questions, comments that they'd like to share? Um, fire can be fabulous. You know, it can been used to heat, for light, for cooking, but it can also be harmful. So, you know, you do need to be aware of house fires, burns, horrible fires that are happening in our environment. So, it's something to be admired as well and. Yes, I think I was telling somebody this morning, I don't think mankind would be where we are in the world if it wasn't for fire. Imagine right. our ancestors and the caveman, if they hadn't been figured out fire, where would we be right now? And we'd probably all be in around the equator someplace, I suppose. Definitely on a paleo diet. <laughs> yeah. Uh, just to let everybody know, uh, Dodge Nature Center, Mick, I think you said it was Mick that did it, yep. uh, did a great video on some of the history of fire building and a great video on some of this stuff online. So I put that link in the chat. If you want to look mm -hmm. on that, I will put Dodge Nature Center's link in there also, um, just so you have a reference to that. And I think part of the point today was, you know, fire has been around for ever and ever. Probably started from a lightning strike or a wildfire or something. And somebody figured out how to save that spark and keep it. I found, I, I learned from Mick because I watched that YouTube video uh, this morning and learn that the Vikings used um, tinder, tinder fungus, it was called. Yeah, they used it, it was, as like a char cloth. Mm -hmm. Yep, so it was a char cloth of their time, and they yeah. actually, they soaked that in urine so that it would use the sodium in there to kind of continue to burn so they could actually catch that spark and put it in a, in a can or in a container and bring that on a voyage with them so they had fire when they got to their next destination, which is a pretty, Pretty amazing and remarkable um, feat, actually, I guess so. And if anybody's tried the bow drill, it's not only the 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 physicality of trying to get that thing going, because you're you're doing friction, so you're really working at it pretty hard. And but it also has a lot to do with the wood too. Some wood, mm -hmm. woods work better than other woods too. And one thing I did grab from my shed today was a char cloth. I'm sure you can find a video and how to make char cloth. Mm -hmm. Does Mix mention it a little bit? I think he does. I think he does. It's actually quite simple. So I know there are a bunch of YouTube videos on there on how. Basically what you do is it's gotta be cotton without spandex. So it can't yep. be stretchy jeans, but good old fashioned Levi's. Cut into small pieces. You would put it into a metal container. These Christmas cookie containers work fabulous. Puncture one small hole to allow some heat to escape. And then you toss this in the fire for about 15, 20 minutes. And when you open it, then you're left with all the pieces charred up as so. And they are a wonderful tool for fire starting because once that spark is caught, it's amazing. Just be careful that if you catch one, remove it from all the others because if it's anywhere near the others, it's a domino effect and the whole container can be lost. So be be char cloth. <laughs> and that has happened to us a few times with students. So just be aware of that. Yep, I always tell them to pull out one piece. You know, I get a little Altoid. I get, this is the, the box I actually make it in. I don't know, it's an old wallet box or something, but yep. there's a little bit of char cloth inside there yet. Um, we made this for a friend that's a big, a big fan, one of the girl's friends. That's a big fan of Survivor. She wanted to do some char cloth and people ask where to buy it. I've never seen char cloth for sale. I don't know if they sell it. I know we've always made ours all the time. So we've never yep. bought it. Anywhere. It's it's so super easy to make. Yeah. 
yeah. look it up on YouTube if you want to. Yeah. Um, I think the video I linked to in the chat, um, you will be able to find in, in yeah. our next video and how to do can, that. Too. You can make these, you can make um, flint and steel. I believe you can even make a Sparky, but in my opinion, it's so much easier to just go and purchase them. They're not an expensive tool. I think both of these are under $10 and they're so helpful and so useful that it's worth just getting a nice one. Yep. Where, and where would people find those if they're interested in buying one? I think you can get them. I know at one point the Science Museum had them for sale in their gift shop. I think Fort Snelling in their gift shop was selling the Flint and Steels. And That's I'm where sure I bought my first one. Like anything, you can find them on Amazon. <laughs> Go to Fort Snelling, though, because that's the coolest place to go buy a Fort yeah, Steel. Right? I would suggest. I also know, like, Gander Mountain and REI, uh, you can purchase them as well. Yep, and there's a ton of varieties. Um, yep. The magnesium and flint and steel, or the magnesium and ferrous rod here. Yep. They yeah. have another one there. Um, you can buy those at just about probably Fleet Farm and everywhere yeah. else, too. Yeah, so, but they are they I are fun things to have. Containers. I've seen them come in little containers like this big that you can hook on your keychain too. So there, there's a wide variety of them. Great, we got a few questions pulling in. Somebody or pouring in here. Somebody was asking about slides. We didn't have any slides today. This is our first uh, live episode. I want to give a shout out to Pam and and Don and in your new camera person. I forgot who that was, but my friend Signy's here doing my camera. So thank you for doing that. It's obviously a rough weather day in Minnesota and Dodge Nature Center is closed. So you guys took the challenge to do it from your kitchen and we really appreciate you sharing your, your knowledge and being flexible and making this happen. So then it's a question of who is your cameraman? I guess somebody put in there. <laughs> Signe, she's great. <laughs> um, the iPad's a little bit funny, so the zooming in and out has been a little weird. Yeah, we had never done things like this until COVID. So COVID was a big eye opener for us when it came to this, as I'm sure it was for many of the people in the audience. Yep, and hopefully we had some students at home that are watching this over their lunch break today because they're an e-learning day today. So that's right. I want to shout out to our friends at the Fur Fin and Feather Club. Um, they meet up in Osseo every Wednesday and. They didn't have a speaker today, so we get to fill in the gap for them. We really appreciate you tuning in. Um, Jody was asking, please repeat the fire gift safety kit supplies for youngsters like 10 year olds. Oh, I, maybe well, the kit I, your son had, I'm guessing she was talking about. Yes, obviously, if you know your children, right? I think our son was allowed to get a pocket knife and one of these when he was what, about 10 years old. Um, we felt that was an appropriate age for our son. Everybody knows their own kid but you know if you're a camping family sometimes people a little earlier if not maybe a little later but something like this is a great christmas present birthday present as long as of course a parent knows about it so we were you know our kid every time we would go on a camping expedition our son was in charge of lighting the fire and i think after he was about eight years old he stopped using matches so i think it's a wonderful gift um, for kids that or the flint and steel with a parent's permission and of course knowing your own child. Yeah, exactly. It's always a fun thing in, in our backyard during COVID, one of my girls yep. who are 13 now, they were I think 12 or 11 when um, and they were in fifth grade, we built a campfire pit in our backyard mm -hmm. during COVID for one of their math projects. So it's always fun to go out there and get them to try to start a fire and little challenges and stuff. Yep. Um, Jody was asking, the bowl thing reminds me of the movie Castaway. How do you sustain the fire long term? For example, if you're in a situation outside for an excess of 12 hours or so, and you talked a little bit about you know starting small and building up, especially with a friction fire or a flint and steel, you got to start super small, preferably with char cloth or some kind of super dry nest material that um, is going to catch that spark. And then you have to build. You just have to keep building it and tending it. It doesn't just maintain itself for 12 hours. It it takes work. Plenty of fuel. You always want to have plenty of fuel. We'll tell students that we won't even talk to them about giving them a match until we feel that sort of their setup is going to burn for about five, ten minutes. So that requires having a lot of extra fuel around because the small stuff's going to go very quickly and then you want to add. And so the key is to have enough stuff to keep adding. Once your fire is large enough, then if you're 
fuel isn't perfectly dry, you can usually continue to add it at the edges because the fire itself will dry it out. But you always want to start small, start dry, and then you can build on that and keep it that way. And never believe a movie when you watch them light a fire. <laughs> they look way too easy, and it's a skill. There's there's some movie magic in there, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> exactly. I always tell when I was teaching fire building, one of the one of our favorite things, we had two favorite things for fire building I used to do. One was the first one to be able to boil a cup of water or yep. boil a cup of water in a plastic cup or a paper cup, excuse me, boil water in a paper cup. And then the other one would be putting a fishing line like a foot off the ground and you have to start a fire in the first one to be able to break that line with your fire. And exactly. I always tell That's kids fire. Yep. I'd always tell kids it's 90% preparation and 10% execution. If yep. you don't have, like you were saying, if you don't have a pile of kindling, you know, a bundle that big around of small kindling and probably twice that size of bigger stuff and even mm -hmm. more stuff outside of that, you're not going to keep your fire going long enough to do some of that stuff. So you are not. And then, of course, with any fire, when you're finished, you want to make sure that it is securely, safely put out. So never leave a fire untended, never leave it going after you're ready to leave. Always make sure you put it out to the fullest safely. So you're like a mind reader, Pam. This is amazing. <laughs> Both Mark and David mentioned in there, she hasn't mentioned much about safety, having water, a blanket, a extinguisher or something to smother your fire. And David put in there, how about putting a fire out different methods? Yeah, we I have a, well, I have a horror story I can tell later. On a day like today, if we were doing a fire building with the students out in the woods, we would just use the snow. Um, you know, in the summer, when things are a lot drier, uh, we have usually, we're usually not very far from a water supply, and we'll have buckets of water around just in case. Um, we always do clear an area. A lot of the students want to put all the rocks around and make it perfect, and we we really do stress with them that that's not as, as important as making sure that you've cleared the area around your fire of anything that you don't want burning. So really just right on the ground on the dirt is perfectly acceptable as long as you've moved everything that's flammable out of the way. And that's a good reason not to start your fire with like leaves and stuff that's mm -hmm. going to start on fire and float up and, and blow someplace else. So Exactly. Um, Exactly. They're very, they're, they're very wispy. You don't want wispy things that are going to take away. And especially consider the weather. If we're under a fire ban, be respectful. Listen, don't light a fire. If There's it's a crazy windy day, things. be be respectful. Don't light a fire. Um, you know, use common sense. And most of the time, you'll be just fine if you do that. Yeah, and I know in the winter, like I've you know put a fire out with some snow and stuff and kind of spread stuff around and make sure everything's cool in the summer having yeah. water is kind of key to being able to do that um you know whatever you can use to put your fire out yeah. i had one trip and the multiple times i've been up to the boundary waters i had one trip where we put the fire out at night and there must have been a hot coal in there and the wind was, was picked up overnight and about three in the morning start smelling smoke and it's like what mm -hmm. is going on and went out and the, the actual one of the coals had kind of flamed up again and had started and we put a bunch of water on there and kind of spread it out obviously not enough but mm -hmm. it definitely um was was a cautionary tale i guess yeah Cindy and i are both nodding our heads because we've been to the boundary waters you do want to remember that bed of coals can go deep and can be very mm -hmm. hot so you want to remember that it's got to be completely out. A lot of people will think, oh, it's good, and wander away, and you really need to be careful. Yeah, I see our next question on there is, we didn't cover a whole lot about matches, but these are my favorite kind of matches. Uh, there's there strike anywhere matches. There's strike on box matches, and then there's strike anywhere matches. And the one match club, Maverick was asking about the one match club, is to see if you can start a fire with just one match, which is hard to do. I've always used the strike anywhere matches because I like to put the two tips together. It's really hard to oh, see fancy. and spark them that way. A lot of times you get both of them that'll start instead of just one. But um, yeah, trying to get a fire being prepared enough, I guess, with your supplies and confident enough in your skills that you can do that, but just try to get a fire going 
for your dinner or your marshmallows or whatever you're setting that fire for with one match. So that's the one match club. Well, and you, you mentioned the key word. If you're prepared, if you've got it set up right, you should be able to get it started with one match. Yep. It only requires more than one match if you haven't set it up correctly. Or in the case of a windstorm. Yeah, every once in a while you get something that's goofy, a match blows out right away or something. But um, one thing you you did mention a little bit, a candle, and one of the things I do, I do a little bit of woodworking on the side. So I've, I save my sawdust. I don't have much um, use for it other than making these, but I melt some old candles down in an old crock pot and then I mix sawdust in them and then I cut them into these little bricks and I can shave these. These are actually, water. I can throw them in the water because they're wax coated, but if I shave them off, it's really a nice way to help get a fire going too, and especially if you had some kind of damp stuff once in a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've had people that have done that where they'll take the egg carton and they'll put the shavings yep. in here and then soak this whole thing in wax. Yep. And so that's a nice little fire starter. I mean, there's all kinds of crazy things you can use as fire starters. You know, I just threw a few of my favorites out here. You know, I said dryer length is another big one that a lot of people mm -hmm. do. In a life or death situation, you could use your hair, but I wouldn't advise people to do that <laughs> for a backyard barbecue. <laughs> Any kids watching at home, no fires and no cutting your hair today. <laughs> and don't burn Jake, had, Jake had a good question on here about native plants. I know I've heard and I've used um, cattails before for that. Do you have any other suggestions or interesting yes, facts I'm about that? Cat, I'm not a cattail fan. I feel like the fluff is too wispy. I have struggled. I feel like there's just still too much moisture left in them. So I'm not a fan of them. Um, I'm really a fan of if you have an evergreen tree and you have the undergrowth that's dried as the tree climbs up, I love that because those are amazingly dry. They're small, they snap. They're probably one of my favorite fire starters is all the dead stuff, not even the needles. I think the needles are okay. I really, really like those really, really, really skinny spruce um, branches that just poke, 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 poke. You can break them off and throw the whole bunch of them on there. They go up like that. That would be my absolute favorite fire starter. And the other good one, birch bark. I think you have some on your table too. Of course, birch bark. Yeah, that it's one's a great always one. a fantastic one. I don't know what is, do you, do you remember what the name of the stuff in birch bark is that burns so well and makes it such a I good don't. I want starter. to say resin, but I don't think that's correct. So you caught me on that one. Me too. Okay, I can't remember it either. But uh, Jody was asking. We mentioned backyard fires and windstorms, and you know, being careful with it. She was wondering about how about my backyard campfires during windy conditions? No red flag for warnings, but just windy conditions. Any miles per hour to not light a fire? Yeah, that uh, that would probably be more you guys than me. But um, I know sometimes we've pushed it, you know, but only if we're out there tending it right away, uh, you know, not leaving it. But I would say, you know, if you, you know what's windy and what's not. It also depends on, I think for me, how long you're gonna be out there. If you're going out for an hour and you're just gonna let the kids roast marshmallows, probably not the end of the world. If you're burning the entire tree that you cut down over a period of 12 hours and it's windy, well, then you might wanna rethink what you're doing. So I guess, you know, I think each, circumstance has to be taken into accord when you're thinking about the wind. Well, Amber, Amber comes away with the, uh, so butylin is a hydro, hydrophobic molecule. It gives birch bark its superior waterproofing abilities. There, there we go. you go. All Thanks, right. Thanks, Amber. Thanks, Amber. Saved us. So, um, Back to the, we asked a couple polling questions at the beginning here um, of your presentation. If nobody is, I think everybody's answered those or a good chunk of you have. So have you ever started a fire with a flint and steel? Uh, 40, well, it's 40 people have not, 40% of the, 40 people that answered, I guess, out of the total that answered. Probably standard. Mm -hmm. Yep. It's not, not something you would normally find and do at your normal store, unless you go to Fort Snelling, probably. Yeah. Have you used, well, ever used it? There Challenge you go. yourselves this spring. Try to start one with flint and steel. Have you ever used a friction device to start a 
start a fire. Only six people have tried that. So mm -hmm. that's, I would say that's par for the course. It's doing a friction fire with a bow drill or a hand roll or something like that is, is really challenging and takes a lot of practice. And when, once you're good at it, I think you can do it, but it oh, yeah. doesn't work. It does. It's a skill. And have you, ever, have you become a member of the One Match Club? 18 people have said yes, 37 said no. So we can share that with the audience too, Amber, if you want. Just as Another challenge, here. another challenge for people. Yeah, all kinds of fun challenges today. It is supposed to get um, windy out this afternoon and we're supposed to get some more snow. So if you're going out there to light a fire, dig a little pit, get out of the wind and uh, challenge yourself to do some of that stuff, but be prepared. So always be prepared, even in the springtime here when you get out camping. Uh, use your common sense, stay safe, and uh, have fun. I guess that's what we're here for, right? I don't see any other questions. Amber, if you see any in the chat that I missed, I think we have that turned off. I think somebody put that in the questions. Why is the chat turned off today? Because it gets really hard to follow questions in the chat. So we try not to use that. I think with that, we are good to sign off. I hope everybody uh, is resting your back and preparing for the next round of snow. Sounds like it should be fun. Probably be a good night to, for some winter camping if you can build a, well, plenty of snow to build a little old Quincy hut or an igloo out there today. So any last words, Pam? No, thanks for inviting us. It was really fun to do this and um, yeah, love to join you guys again someday. Great. And I just want to remind everybody out there, next week we start our spring series of programs. We're starting with turkeys. It's the, I believe, the 50th anniversary of the reintroduction of turkeys to Minnesota. Woo. So we're going to start off with, with that talk, talking a little bit about turkeys with um, the, I forget the name of the club now, the Turkey Federation. But we'll be there with them uh, talking about the reintroduction of the turkeys. So you can sign up for that on our website minnesotadnr.gov slash discover and also visit uh, dodge nature center's website they have some really cool fun programs if you want to come and experience using a hand drill or lighting a fire you guys probably have a program coming up about that at some time and over the summer probably but it'll be fun so thank you very much and thanks again so much for uh, making this work today it, i know it was a challenge and you did a fantastic job so it was great thanks benji we'll see you later Bye, everybody. Thanks, everyone.